Hey everybody, this is Ben Kesnoka, co-founder and partner at Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is our podcast, where we go deep on all things business and technology with world-leading experts. All right. Good afternoon. I was thinking we got the little fireplace behind. We could have actually had a fireside chat in front of the actual fireplace, which is a rare opportunity. It's a gigantic fireside chat. Yeah. It would be, indeed. Um, well, we have a, a giant of Silicon Valley with us here today, and Guillermo, who's atop one of the most important companies in tech today in Vercel. And so we're going to have a bit of a conversation about the founding story, lessons, AI, what's going on, and all things tech, and then uh, we'll open it up for a broader discussion and, uh, and questions. Guillermo, thank you for being here. We were last together uh, at our other event, The Grove for Unicorn Founders, where you had the tall order of following Jensen Huang's theatrics um, and presented. He gave us chips, remember? He, that's right, yeah, we got, he gave free, uh, free, free, chips. free H100s for everyone attended, meaning potato chips that were branded. Uh, he Global. said, look under your chair, there's yeah. free chips. Yeah. Yeah. And we looked, and it's like literally a bag of chips <laughs> with this face on them. Yeah. So, um, but great to have you with us. And we have a bunch of, of, of early stage founders as well as some angels uh, and, and, and GPs. So let's start with just getting everyone on the same page about the founding story of Vercel, where the company stands today, and maybe importantly, how do you interface with the early stage startup ecosystem? Yeah, founding story, I would say there's many checkpoints in time. Once upon a time, I was, uh, I was born and, and grew up in Argentina, and I became obsessed with front-end engineering and open source in the early days. And I always tell people that uh, deploying a hyperlink to the open web was my raft out of Argentina, which is a little bit of an exaggeration because Argentina has a lot of problems, but it wasn't too desperate of a situation, but it allowed me to connect with the world. It got me a job in, through an uh, open source a library called Mutuals. I got a job internationally. I left Argentina, moved to the Bay Area. So front end engineering has always been this thing that has tremendous alpha for companies. If you make a really delightful web experience, if you make a really delightful UI, you're way more likely to capture customers, retain them, turn them into loyal fans. And for certain uh, industries like e-commerce, you dramatically increase conversion. Having a better front end is better for your business. So I decided to start a company around the idea of maximizing the potential of the front end on the web, and uh, that's how Vercel was born. So um, we created a framework called Next.js, which is sort of our open source framework that allows you to create very dynamic and, and very fast web applications. Next.js is very interesting because it grew out of me scratching a niche. Uh, I wanted to create a website for my startup at the time. The founding story is actually, this is a checkpoint that was really, really interesting. So I sold my first company to WordPress, and I left, and I knew that I wanted to start another startup. And I wanted to use the best practices available at the time. So there were two that were really popular on Twitter and Hacker News, which is how one decides what technologies to use, of course. One was React.js. So Meta, at the time it was called the Facebook, or Facebook. They've been through three rebrands now, I think about it, that's funny. <laughs> so they uh, open sourced what they had discovered to be an incredible way of creating front end interfaces. Um, and I call it a discovery more so than an invention because it's such an awesome way of structuring very, very complex front end applications. They open sourced it, they gave React to the world. Kudos to Meta, they've now since open sourced Llama, PyTorch, a lot of amazing things. And then simultaneously, Google had open source Kubernetes. And me, I'm trying to start a company. I said, I'm going to use Kubernetes, and I'm going to use React. And then I think it was like four weeks later, and I maybe had one website up and running. And it, it had taken me, an expert that had dedicated their entire life to front end engineering, weeks just to set up all of the necessary infrastructure and frameworks to actually just publish a website on the internet. And this is like eight years ago. So that's when the spark happened for me. What if I could make it take seconds instead of weeks? And what if I could give this gift of tremendous iteration velocity and automation to every company in the planet? And it was all predicated on this idea of 
iterating really fast. Give the developer really good tools. We became known for prioritizing this idea of developer experience or DX. And from there, we grew a pretty large cloud infrastructure business that now sits at over 100 million in annualized revenue. Awesome. And, and talk about how you work with startups and the value prop and the sort of partnership uh, motions with startups today. Yeah, what's awesome about Vercel is we're the front end cloud. So we need the rest of the cloud ecosystem in order to successfully deliver a, a complete web application, right? So an example is when you go to ChatGPT, you're going to a Next.js website that under the hood connects to cloud services, namely, of course, the ChatGPT API and a bunch of other cloud services to do things like login. For example, it uses Auth0 for login. Every time you, you authenticate, they didn't roll out login from scratch. Same when you go to the, your billing details of ChatGPT. It uses a Stripe as an API. So what's amazing about modern engineering, especially at scale, is that a modern cloud native application is a nexus of all kinds of services that sort of convene at the front end layer to deliver the, to the user an awesome experience. What Vercel tries to do is the opposite of shipping the org chart. When you go to a, a, an application that's hosted on Vercel, you should have an amazing experience, even though there's all these modules under the hood. So the opportunities for startups in our ecosystem is there's so much upside in joining this family of services that are very easy to integrate. We provide API so that companies can make one-click install services that they can offer to our developers. Next.js now has over a million monthly active developers. So whenever you create a Next.js friendly integration or API, you're accessing sort of the, this gigantic pool of developers that are operating at all levels of scale. So I always remind people, when you learn Next.js, you're not just learning a front-end framework skill set. You're learning how to deliver applications at the scale of ChatGPT or Claude or Perplexity, but also the largest e-commerce customers in the world, like Nike.com and Adidas.com are both powered by Next.js, but also every side hustle that you see on Hacker News, not maybe not every, but like a lot of them, like if you want to create a quick experiment, that kind of developer is also using Next.js. So what we've been able to accomplish with the help of the community is a framework that scales up and down really nicely. So if you bet on integrating with it, you get access to this massive distribution. Okay, let's talk a little bit about AI, and then we'll, we'll close with company building, entrepreneurship lessons, and we'll open it up for the, for for the sure. broader discussion. So on AI, you mentioned you sold your uh, previous company to Automatic. Yeah. You have a lot of views in open source versus proprietary. You made the argument that in the long run, open source wins Yes. Um, in the history of software. And open platforms. Open platforms. What's your mental model for thinking about AI today in that context? Yeah, I, I created this provocative framework around open versus closed. So when Unix came out, there were a lot of proprietary versions of Unix that nowadays, if I say this, if I, if I said their names in this room, like most people have not even heard of them, right? So like there was AIX, there was HP Unix, there was Solaris, um, there was uh, SCO, SCO, and all of these variants of proprietary Unix ended up just dying and relegated to legacy. And the thing that ended up winning was Linux, which was this open source initiative by some quote unquote random guy in Finland that literally introduced a project to a mailing list calling it, this will I think this will never amount to anything more than a toy. So the power of ecosystems like Linux was predicated on the community that was built and the distributed global infrastructure that was built around it. And the paradox is it actually took longer for Linux to catch up to the proprietary Unix competitors. So they had all kinds of advantages, like better hardware support and mainframe integration. Uh, Linux always struggled with drivers. Like I could never mm -hmm. configure my Wi-Fi on my Linux desktop. But it doesn't matter because this movements of, of these communities are so overwhelmingly difficult to compete with over time. 
So I try to apply that, mo that mental model to, to open AI in, in the sense of <laughs> like open the source AI, that, yeah. where we have to be cognizant that some technical advantages in the short term do not guarantee long-term vitality. So I, I try to sort of always keep in mind that we have to hedge our bets. And I think if I were to bet over the long haul, my, my, my heart and my, the history background that I've gotten from learning about Linux and other technologies would make me bet on open. So does that mean that, just take OpenAI, the company specifically, you're a seller, not a buyer at $87 billion valuation? <laughs> so it's hard to say about valuations and trading stocks. What I can tell you is, Vercel's position is developer experience is one of the sort of things that end up deciding how people choose one technology or the other. In fact, if I go back to the origin story of Next.js, React was a very, very exciting technology. But Next.js, the, the way that I explain it is React was like the engine, but companies needed a car. They didn't want to assemble every single piece of the stack every single time, and that's why Vercel ended up being successful. With AI, think about the same. So the LLM is just one specific component. And one of the things that we're, we're building at Vercel is what we call the AI SDK, which is a developer experience that sits on top of all the models. And I'm not going to say it commoditizes them, because all these models have different strengths in different benchmarks. But what I recommend to developers is to actually m create that optionality even in their code base. Don't marry yourself only to one model buy the index fund of all AI instead of picking one stock. So that would be the mm. answer to like how I think about open AI. In a more macro sense, just as a sidebar, uh, the concerns over safety and open, AI, open, open source AI, overrated, underrated, like where do you, you don't seem overly concerned about that, right? I think you, Absolutely not. You think the ex, the, <laughs> so the existential risk, potential for misuse or abuse yeah. doesn't concern you. We're just talking, so since, uh, I'm from Argentina, Millet is this super interesting character that's it's, it's, the president of Argentina. Yeah, it's cap he's captured the attention of a lot of the Silicon Valley leaders. We hosted a dinner here in Silicon Valley with, with President Millet. And one of the things he said that I thought was really thought provoking, his framework through which he analyzes a lot of the current events is the libertarian framework of let the market decide everything, et cetera, et cetera. And he applied that to AI safety, and I thought it was very, very interesting. So he said, when Adam Smith wrote about the wealth of the nations, he studied this uh, thought experiment of a pin manufacturing factory. And one of the points that he makes in the analysis is that the ability for this factory to maximize its productivity was predicated on a couple factors. One was the specialization of the tasks that the workers could produce, but ultimately what decides how many pins get manufactured is the loss of supply and demand. If the market really, really wants pins, everything will be reconfigured for this factory to produce more pins. And through competition and deregulation, you're going to see that the most successful nations in the world are the ones that sort of let that supply determine how many of these pins get manufactured. He applied that to the concept of AI safety. and thought it was really interesting because a lot of folks are, are worried that if the uh, power of these models, the reasoning ability of these models continues to increase, they could turn against human beings. But ultimately, what decides whether we fund all of these AI labs, whether we decide to fund NVIDIA, whether we buy all of these stocks, or we invest in these AI startups, will be the demand from customers to want to buy these AI products, right? So just like the demand for pins was determining how many pins were going to be manufactured, the demand for AI will determine whether we continue to invest in these models. So if AIs are turning against consumers, it's very unlikely that we will continue to fund AI. So but my, isn't, isn't the idea that we may not know they're turning against us until it's too late? <laughs> well, like, how, what's the feedback no. loop on, on, on their rebellion against humanity? I think it's very simple, right? Like, we, we, every time there is a model release, for a week, everyone freaks out and said, we, we, that, this happened to us when we launched V0. And every so often, every, we release a new capability, and we get the same feedback from people. For those that don't know, V0 is our chat GPT for web, web developers. You can go in and you type, build me a front-end application. And we specifically called it V0, by the way, because we made the case that it's version 0. We very much need the human to be in the loop with the current model capabilities to give feedback to the model 
and get into a conversation and prompt and reprompt and improve. So first of all, we do not believe that AI will take the entire front end engineer job. However, that for that one week, everyone's freaking out. Oh my God, Vercel is taking our jobs. I still have a few trolls that pursue me in every conversation that I'm having on Twitter, and they say that, oh, like conspiracy theories about taking people's jobs. In reality, I very much I'm in the camp of like job and capability amplification. So we'll make developers thought, so much more productive. I thought, you've, I thought you've said elsewhere that you think developers can be, in, there are elements of the development community that will be endangered, that, that there might be commodity, um, sort of transformation of certain UX elements, designers. Certain elements of the process. Yeah. So I believe two things. So what type of developers are going to be worse off in a couple of years, due to, or the jobs won't exist as much? Yeah. So I believe that developers always want to do more. I believe that we should never pigeonhole them. Right? We should never say, your skill is only good for creating just the navigation of this website. Or your, your skill set is only good for styling this page that was created by somebody else. And I think what I've been noticing, especially with the rise of this role that uh, has now come to get the name of design engineer, uh, engineers are becoming more and more ambitious, uh, assisted by the innovations in these tools. They can do a lot more. So I can design, and I can engineer. A lot of the people that we employ at Vercel are experts in just crafting product experiences. So design engineer, is that a job title inside Vercel? Correct. And, and so what was that person's job title? But like, if you, what was that? Used to, it used to be called it was like UX well, meets software. Some engineer. of those people have actually self-actualized, right? Yeah. They used to be just designers, yeah. and some of them just used to be engineers. In fact, I'm, I would call myself a design engineer when I'm, I'm doing my side hustles during the weekends and testing our own products. And I come from the background of front-end engineering from a very code-centric, API-centric, algorithm-centric. And I taught myself how to design pretty pixels. So going back to your point about, or your, your question about, I think that there's a lot of what it takes to design pretty pixels that is actually just a statistical. What I realized this early on when I taught myself design that, for example, increasing the amount of padding in a containing box created just more vi visual beauty. Like it's just easier to read, it's easier on the eyes. And then Apple has this tremendous studies on like what is the right bezier curve of border radius. Like if you look at the icons on your home screen, they've carefully designed just what is the most aesthetically pleasant border radius. And what happens is designers, like some of the designers that work at Vercel, actually became almost like AIs themselves. Like they just crawl through websites like Dribbble and Twitter and Figma community files, and they're constantly ingesting data of what good user experiences are. And I believe that a lot of that will be preceded because AIs will do a much better job at consuming massive amounts of data of, of what good design mm. is and then the design engineer will be able to provide the frontier mm. of that. Does anyone have design engineers at your company? Is that a title anyone uses? Okay, interesting. So this is a fr sort of frontier it's idea. It's frontier role. Frontier, idea. frontier like job it. role. Yeah. Um, and uh, let's just actually pause and see if anyone has questions or comments on the AI theme. I mean, we're going to switch to company building and like his lessons learned, entrepreneurship, raising capital. But before we move on from AI, anyone want to ask questions or comments? Yeah, Shamra. I'm, I'm curious, what do you think of the role of these new co-pilots for engineers, and is there any part of the engineering workflow that is going to be like fully automated? I believe that there's going to be a lot of in, a, a specific tasks that used to take an enormous amount of time that will be taken over by agents. I think when I think about translating an idea from a sketch or a mock-up into a work in front end, I think of that job almost as translation. And what happened to translators? I mean, there is a job called translator today, but the vast majority of us that are not doing something that's very much at the cutting edge of like translating a, 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 a famous book, we're just automating 100% of that task. And I believe that for a lot of people building software, that, that idea of producing that front end code from a design, or even from the idea of the design. What's really interesting is, 
A lot of people don't know what the best way to present a certain type of data is, period. They need an external influence, they need external data. I, I, a funny story from the early days of Next.js is, Next.js started finding a lot of like verticals where it was really, really successful. Early on, one, one that, was, that really stood out to me was um, property, list, property listing websites. In, in, in a couple of weeks, I got calls by Zillow, and Trulia, and Hilton.com, and teams at Airbnb, and it boggled my mind that they were all building the same thing. You, you probably know this because it's become a standard UI, but a pattern that became really, really popular in those websites is you split the screen, and on the right-hand side, you have Google Maps and pins. And the left-hand side, you have properties. Now, if you want to innovate in this regard, and if you're a traditional, non-tech native company, you're not gonna go through like the 100 years of like trial and error to find what the right UX pattern for rendering property listings is. You're gonna go with the statistically correct answer. And on top of that, you're gonna layer your branding. So that entire UX research job and design experimentation and all of that does become, I think, just automated away. But again, I think it's just the foundation and then there's gonna be human creativity layered on so top. So UI and UX developers, designers are at risk? I think they're not at risk in so far the, that expertise is not useful. I think if they can, they have to level they can up, use I mean. AI to augment themselves and now go even further. That's why I think we're yeah. seeing the success with this design engineering role because people with the help of these tools and these co-pilots can now go further. Mm. Yeah. Uh, front engineers can be so much more ambitious these days. Okay, other questions or comments on the AI theme? Yep, we can have Lindsay. I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about your journey going from open source to commercializing uh, your product and whether or not you think any of the developments in AI is gonna change that for current companies who are trying to follow a similar pattern. Yeah, it's fascinating because I recently had uh, a couple thoughts around, we've, uh, at Vercel we've spent a tremendous amount of time analyzing and studying and collecting data around what are LLMs best at in terms of code generation? We have extensive benchmarks and evals around different programming languages, front end libraries. In fact, a funny story from a couple of years ago was uh, GPT was obsessed with producing code that recommended, recommended an HTTP library called Axios. But the vanguard of web development had already moved on from Axios. In fact, it was extremely disrecommended by Google. And uh, as you know, Google has a very large um, developer relations for, uh, workforce that tries to advise folks on how to create really fast websites such that when you go to Google, you get your 10 blue links. Google is very, very incentivized that when you click that blue link, it's really fast. So they invented this metrics called the Core Web Vitals. And a lot of what Vercel does is like help you meet that standard so that you get really good SEO and really good prevalence in search results. And one of the things that Google found is that library was just too heavy. It was created for a time when it was necessary, but now it had proliferated across the entire internet. And guess what happened? These LLMs, I mean, they're smart, but they're also, again, very statistical. So they found lots of code that used Axios. So when you went and you asked, hey, can you write me a quick app to do, the kind of demo where that is very, still very, very prevalent in social media. Can you write me a quick app that does this and this? Boom, Axios. So that's when we started realizing that there's a lot of opportunity to sort of augment these LLMs and, and orient them. Because left to their own devices, they're just gonna do what is like most commonly recommended, right? So I think for, for us, one of the things that we found is we have to continue to sort of stay very close to these benchmarks and, and these evals, and that kind of becomes your IP for your company. Like, the, your differentiation is rooted in, like, what is the, the, that advantage that you have. Apply to open source, maybe there's a concern that AIs could ossify certain choices in tooling, right? Maybe now there's more Axios prevalence, even though it's not the best idea. So when you're thinking about open source, I think you have to now consider, I call this the new network effect. Because before you had to worry about 
developers and their choices and their social, like in GitHub and whatever. But now you have to consider the neural network's recommendations of open source. You also have to consider that LLMs are good at generating certain kinds of code. One, another thing we found is they strongly favor, and this is unsurprising, local reasoning. So the example that I give people here is LLMs are much better at producing Tailwind CSS. If you're not familiar with Tailwind CSS, when it produces code, it embeds the information about the style of that code in, in the code. Again, the best practice prior to that library was separating code from style. So you had two files. Guess what? LLMs struggle separating in a larger context. Oh, here's all the styles. I'm going to generate them. And now I'm going to generate all the HTML. Guess what? They kind of suck at it, but they're really, really good at Tailwind. So what I think is very novel is that you might have to design in the future open source patterns in the context of, no pun intended, what LLMs are best at. And you're going to have to be very, very cognizant of what LLMs are recommending with regards to your open source project. And then the other layer of that is sort of building the business in open source. I can, I can go into that as well. Yeah, if people are interested in that. Other, other questions on, on sort of AI specifically? Let's go in the back, and then we can go here. For sure. Uh, let's start. Yeah, start back there. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Mohey. Uh, big fan of Vessel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, can you introduce yourself to Yeah, I'm Gautam. Um, I work at Coinbase. And um, I've been an angel investor for a few years now. And my question is sort of like excited to see the V0. I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the long-term vision of where you see the AI SDK going, in particular with integrations with Langchain or any third-party integrations. Yeah, yeah we, we, I talked earlier about we believe that developers should have optionality with regards to model. And we created the AI SDK to give you a very, very thin layer. It's a very minimalistic toolkit to focus on developer experience and the ability to choose your model. Even, uh, and I think the bet is paying off, not just because of downloads and things like that, but just this week, um, Google announced that you can now go to uh, your Google Chrome settings and enable an experimental flag for a model that runs inside the browser. It's Gemini Nano, and it's, it's an incredible model. It's really fast. It's obviously more cost efficient than going over to the cloud. And you can do amazing things with it. For example, like in the client, without going to the internet, for every keystroke, you can do inference. And guess what? We're able to implement that model, and we released a, uh, an open source implementation of this model today in a matter of minutes without changing our code base. We plugged uh, Gemini Nano through Chrome AI into the AI SDK. So the bet is really paying off that there is a need for a very lightweight abstraction layer on top of the models that is also very easy for JavaScript developers. So the bet that I made is Python is the language of research scientists and open AI researchers and Jupyter notebook wielders. But the language of application development is TypeScript and JavaScript. So we're betting that the AI SDK will become how we actually bridge the gap between hand wavy research and frontier models and things like that to actual value for end users. So that's the bet with AI SDK. Can we reduce the time to AI for the average product company in the world? Going back to the design engineer. Now a design engineer can write a frontier AI application with, I think, the example that we put out with the Gemini models four lines of code. Guillermo, more about your entrepreneurship journey and lessons for entrepreneurship. But just first, a little bit of a personal question. I wonder how it informs your worldview. To what extent does being growing up in Argentina from 0 to 19, how has that shaped the way you think and work? Like, in what ways are you uniquely Argentinian as an entrepreneur, as a person? I love steak. Yeah. <laughs> no, I actually, uh, <laughs> actually, a lot of people ask me about this, and I, I kind of like it. Um, so number one is just that, like, I love the idea of giving tools to every person in the world, regardless of where they are, to publish. And I think the, there's a, such a spiritual connection here with uh, Matt from WordPress, who bought my first company, because WordPress is all about like, letting people publish uh, in the form of blogs. Vercel is let people publish any kind of application onto the cloud. And I think, for me, I didn't have the ability to buy software. So open source was like, 
amazing. I remember my dad was like, it's too good to be true. Like, let's go, do, let's go research this Linux thing. It's free, what the hell? So I think the, the idea of like free access to information and free access to publishing, I, I really believe that what Apple has done with their like, approach to getting a developer license, getting a, a spe the, the DUNS number. Have you ever published to the App Store? You have mm -hmm. to get a number called the D-U-N-S. Yeah, yeah. Like, what the hell is that? Yeah. Like, I just want to publish an app. So just getting, but hold on, just on the Argentinian thing. You, yeah. uh, you, we were talking at lunch earlier today about people who are up and down versus even keel. Yeah. The stereotype of people in Argentina, I would say, and lived in Latin America for a year, is you know, very passionate, very emotional, very enthusiastic. Yeah. I'm curious, as an entrepreneur, are you, like, do you have highs and lows more, or have you had to like, develop like, an even keel state of mind to endure yeah, yeah. the journey of entrepreneurship? It's funny. I do think there's a lot of that um, lead with your emotions. It, yeah, and it has, it has pluses and minuses. Um, but I believe that, the, for example, Vercel being critical web infrastructure for the world requires a leadership team that has absolutely no biases whatsoever, that has an utmost regard for confidentiality and security. So it, it requires this sort of like incredible like discipline and in the way we communicate with the world, we try to remove all of emotion as, as, as much as possible. But internally, I believe that there is a culture of urgency, for example. I've, I've always been, an, uh, there's no tomorrow. Tomorrow is not promised person. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's because I'm an immigrant. Um, how do you cultivate, I think all the startups here want to have a culture like that, a culture of urgency. How do you cultivate that? I think storytelling is a really powerful thing. I think um, going back to the sun, so Solaris, that Unix, proprietary Unix example that I talked about, uh, the, the rise and fall of Sun Microsystems is, is, for the people that were around, is a tragic tale. And I love this thing that uh, Mark Zuckerberg did for the uh, Facebook office where he, he put the sign of Facebook at the campus, but he used the Sun Microsystems. He kept the back of the sign, was the previous Sun Microsystems logo. And that was just this visceral always on reminder of tomorrow's on promise. We could be sun tomorrow. We could just get acquired or go out of business or start decelerating. Tomorrow's on promise. So I think for me, I feel that always to the bone because in technology, the, the need for self-actualization is, is like there's no other industry that matches it. So I buy that. Let me just challenge it for a sec, though, because I think there is, there is a difference. What's interesting is how do you cultivate urgency among employees for whom this is more a job than it is for you? Like, they're passionate, but they, yeah. but they don't own well, the I company. Well, I try to select missionaries, missionaries not yeah. mercenaries. But I think, like, so, I feel like founders often default to long-term optimistic, and they have to, like, remind themselves. Short-term pe pessimistic. Yeah, in the, 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 for example, I, I read heard about the, this. I think it's Tribe invented that, like, Short-term long -term pessimist, long-term long -term optimist. Yeah, that's interesting. Like I read the um, I read the memoir about BlackBerry, Rem's rise and fall. And yeah. as you're talking, I was thinking it would be interesting for companies to have a book club of like yeah. all the stories of all these once great Absolutely. companies that failed. And I collect but, a lot of those. And yeah. I, 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 but I actually I, do this more with the executive team. I remind them, like, do you want to be X? Okay, yeah. So maybe like, don't ship forget. Tomorrow right. But of... that is, if you already have the default long-term optimism, then the kind of fear and anxiety can be good. Like, yeah. don't forget, you don't want to be the next sun. I'm wondering yeah. for a broader employee base, is it would it be better to talk more about like the op, like just we could be the next yeah. Amazon. We could be like yeah. you know play the upside more in yeah. terms of how do you think about balancing that between your like hardcore exec team and then the long. Yeah, I, I don't think you can get too high on the Kool Aid of like just pure optimism. Mm -hmm. I think you do need to infuse a, a, a realism. Mm -hmm. What I do a lot that is super helpful and constructive is uh, put it through the lens of the customer. So I spend a lot of time talking to customers, and I remember powerful anecdotes from the customer. And I then contextualize urgency with that storytelling of customers. For example, going back to if I have to explain the importance of change management for production and mission critical infrastructure, I use a lot of examples of our healthcare customers and how important it is that every single SLO is met and every single deployment succeeds Sometimes, and again, 
this is a day-to-day -day grind, but sometimes we get the occasional tweet that says, I just don't know how you guys are so reliable. And it's not that reliability was a magic thing that we sparkled onto the system. This quarter, we're gonna focus on reliability. I actually shared recently on Twitter, I concluded that reliability is equal parts technology in culture. The culture of reminding yourself of all of those edge cases, of chasing down the edge case. I, I have an internal meme around cosmic rays. So cosmic rays can create this single event of hardware defects. And I believe there was a, a write-up from uh, S3 where they detected a durability failure on a specific bit flip, on a specific hard drive. And that's why they have so much redundancy and they make so many copies and they check some. They produce cryptographic hashes every single checkpoint of the pipeline because faults can be introduced even randomly. Faults can be introduced by cosmic rays. So what I remind the team is it's so easy for engineers and product people to say, oh, it must just have been the internet. Just reboot your computer and it'll sort itself out. And I'm always like, sometimes, you know, PMs have, hard, have a hard time because if I find a bug and they tell me, oh, well, like, just log out and log back in again, I will not do it. I will go, I will have broken software for an entire year. Whatever it takes, I want to see a systemic resolution of that and infuse that culture of, again, the care for reliability and, like, it's always on us. Yeah, I like that. And, and some of us were with Lucas Bywald a couple weeks ago at a village event uh, from Weights of Biases, and we were talking about some of his lessons learned and prescriptions in entrepreneurship. And he came back to the simple principle of talk to customers. He's like, every founder knows they should, and no one talks to enough customers. Yeah. And it's like this deeply held belief and going deep and on And partners. It. So mm. I was just in New York for a couple of days, and maybe this is something I didn't know at the beginning. Mm. How important partners were going to be in, in, in fueling the, the traction of Vercel. And as we get into more complex enterprises, we're almost never alone. So we're gonna be with the partner startups that provide all the services that I spoke about. They were going to, there's gonna be the front end cloud and there's gonna be the auth zeros and stripes and the stripes of the future. But also there's gonna be the implementation partners mm -hmm. that become experts in your technology and build businesses around it. Yeah, even the people that build, we have a huge community of people that build and sell templates. And so bringing everyone along for the journey is, is one of those hacks. And talking to them, because they're like a multi-customer. Yeah. They're a customer that creates more, more customers. And we have that internal meme of like, partners are customers. Mm -hmm. And you have to be obsessed about uh, interviewing them and, yeah. and bringing those stories. Um, what are some of your controversial beliefs about entrepreneurship? Or what are things you believe that other founders might not? Uh, um, I believe... I have, a, I have a conflicting belief, so maybe it's like a cop-out, but I have a conflicting belief. Some of the best investments that I've ever made have been people that are completely obsessed with a problem for a year or an area for years and years and years and years. And that's the entrepreneur that I love to bet on. So I've been obsessed with front engineering for like 20 years. And when I invested in Zero, I met a team of people that were obsessed with identity. And I remember having that epiphany of like, holy crap, how can you be obsessed with logging in and logging out? It's like, <laughs> like what the hell? And they were telling me all the books that they'd written and the talks that they'd given and like uh, all of the dreams that they had for like better off. And it was like home run, you know? Uh, and yet it's not a silver bullet. Like you always find people that stumble upon ideas. And so that's- And what's really hard about that is when founders become successful, and they tell the story of their startups, right. the narrative will almost always be, yeah, oh, ever since right. I was eight years old, I believe in this. And there's a prominent- Ever since I was in the womb. Yeah, exactly. I was, I was passionate about- obsessed with AI. Yes, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. There's a prominent example of a, of a very successful tech company today where the CEO has a very touching story about how the mission is so aligned with his deep passions. And I happen to have firsthand knowledge that he, right. he's in a venture firm office as That's an EIR, right. going through hundreds of different ideas on the whiteboard, analytically evaluating That's every right. idea. They arrived at a good business That's right. idea, That's right. but then on, on CNN, you're telling a much different story. Yeah. yeah. So maybe the controversial idea, Elon just tweeted about this. He said, the CEO of an aerospace company, Elon like just Boeing, tweeted about this? Say again? Elon just tweeted about this? Yeah, he just tweeted that. Uh, you can just say he. Uh, yeah, yeah, he. He just tweeted about it. Uppercase yeah. H, or even lowercase H, <laughs> tweeted about, uh, well, yeah, duh, the CEO of an aerospace company should know about 
aircrafts and developing aircrafts, because and not about spreadsheets. And it was a critique of Boeing, because Boeing continues to have drama around like. Because Boeing hired like a BCG person or something. Who's the current? The CEO is like some non. The suits took over, yeah. right? And so maybe the controversial belief is that I think maybe there is a middle where like for certain classes of companies you can pull that off, and then I think for the long-term generational companies, you have to really invest in a leadership team that is intimately familiar with the problem space and lives and breathes that problem. And it might be a meta thing, it might be like just how Amazon became obsessed with customers. And I think there is a sense of like, if there is no obsession, if there is just like opportunism, if there's just like, what is the cool idea that it'll get me VC funded, um, I'm, I'm somewhat allergic to that and I try to stay away from it. But I, yeah. I've also seen it work, so. Well, and I do think it's like one of these things, we, we, we were talking in one of our sessions earlier about how at Village we look for obsession, not just passion out of founders. Oh, nice. But also, anytime the high status sort of like answer is known by founders or, or someone who's interviewing for a job, when the high status answer is known, people can game interviews or game pitches, right? A founder can pitch you and talk yeah. about how they're obsessed and say all the right well, words. Well, speaking of AI, we're, I was just evaluating uh, our tests that we do for support engineers. And like the job interview yeah, tests? Yeah, and I realized that like, we're, we're getting gamed, that the take-home exercise is not because there were too many Delve words, but I could tell that there were some strange similarities between the submissions of different people. And I, I realized that you know, like we have to be like even more paranoid now. Not not that a uh, cyborg will enter, will walk into your office, but there is a sense of like the verifiability of the story and the verifiability of knowledge that in the age of AI will become. Well, even... it's kind of like the the commercial world version of what teachers are freaking out with students. That's using right. Using AI to generate do homework, right? But like, for entrepreneurs. Yeah, for entrepreneurs or for job yeah. interviews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. interesting. Um, you're famous for. Valuing, uh, praising the importance of, of iteration and, and velocity, and it's, and it's something it's hard to generalize about what characteristics define good entrepreneurs. But speed of iteration seems to be one thing that all great entrepreneurs have in common. How do you promote a culture of iteration and speed of iteration inside Vercel? And what advice do you have for the founders on how to do that in their their organization? Yeah, as we've gone from a single product company to a multi product company, um, giving people ownership over the different products and letting them run with that while giving them a framework. For, for example, we believe a lot, we believe strongly in this idea of analyzing a product experience with fresh eyes and trying to remove all of the assumptions that we have about how much the customer knows about our technology. So instead of me going into every product leader and like helping them like QA the product, we're giving them all these principles around like, okay, like, look, you're in charge of your product and you can release it, you can tweet about it, you can interview customers, but here's a set of principles that we strongly believe in. For example, around what makes a successful onboarding experience. We, we're obsessed with the zero to one of any new product. Uh, yeah, I heard you say you were geeking out over Zapier's uh, onboarding experience Absolutely. and how they, they, you couldn't click the Zapier logo to get out of the onboarding flow. Like they trapped you in that so flow. Good. And so <laughs> good. What, in are fact, other, what are other onboarding, what products have epic onboarding experiences? Uh, so one that got acquired recently, sadly for me, because I wanted them to keep going. Uh, has anyone heard of the X1 credit card? Or has anyone invested in the X1 credit card? So it just got acquired by Robinhood. The Robinhood credit card is going to be this uh, company called yeah. X1. It, uh, it was a former product leader at Twitter. I had never, I had never experienced such a, a smooth onboarding experience where I signed up for the credit card. They'd implemented every trick in the book. Not only the I can't press the logo to interrupt the onboarding, but everything was big. All the buttons were tappable on mobile. I, I think the, I even onboarded myself entirely from a link on a tweet which if you really geek out on web engineering, one of, the, one of the things that is really hard is when you find yourself in an in-app browser, it's hellish to do anything. You're more constrained in space. If you, if you open anything in a new window, uh, Apple isolates the cookie jars. So you're logged in in the in-app web browser potentially, and then you're logged out in Safari. So these people had mastered all of these little details. And I got my credit card 
into Apple Wallet as a virtual credit card, and then my credit card delivered within 24 hours. Hmm. And just the experience was phenomenal. I was like, that idea of, again, optimizing the mild intent, because a, a lot of customers on the internet have mild intent. They're, we're all kind of like exploring. We're all doom scrolling a little bit here and there. Just like endlessly, yeah. You have to be able to really catalyze. So yeah. that, that was a memorable one for me because it had a hardware component. The credit card showed up. I actually have it here. Um, and I've sent this founder such a, an overwhelming amount of feedback. He's a saint. What kind of wallet is that? Um, oh, this is a customer of Vercel Sacred. It's a... Uh, so you, can, you press a button that pops the card. It's the best up. wallet in the world. Wow. So we'll sign I, around So the this is that. another trick that I advocate for my customers, like there's no tomorrow. Like I will go to war for my customers. So I, and I buy their products, and then by buying their products, I use the website, and then I send them product feedback. Mm. This website was phenomenal. Uh, but this is the X1 credit card. It's uh, okay, just read that number. Titanium. Out, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but yeah, so it had the hardware component. Yeah. So it was like hardware onboarding, yeah. virtual onboarding, everything about it was phenomenal, and, and a beautiful uh, web application as well. So. Yeah, um, and again, like simplicity. Like the, the, the other problem with... And just finish your point, but we're gonna go to questions in a sec, so yeah. come up with your questions for Guillermo. Finish. Of why you have to narrow the product focus is that there's all of these unknowns. Like maybe you just didn't know that in a web browser gonna, we're gonna ruin your life. So you almost have to have this assumption that like things are gonna get so complex that you have to have a reluctance to extend the product surface. Because what do you think you already ticked the box off, and it could be something as simple as my customers can sign up, is not quite a given as you might assume it is. Mm. Yeah, fantastic point. Um, questions? Hi, I'm Mila, and I'm a former product person, so I have a product question for you. And by the way, love the design engineering job rack. Oh, this nice. is great. We have a blog post about it, uh, <laughs> if you want to read it. Love it. Um, so with the Nano, ability to run localized model. Um, it's going to enable a lot of personalization on the front end level. Do you see this happening, actually? Like when every person in this room, let's say they, they go to google.com and everybody's going to get their own Absolutely. version of google.com, do you see it only on the web or do you see it trickling down to the app level as well? And if so, When's your bet? When's going to happen? Absolutely. This Do you want to be Ray Kurzweil and tell us when the singularity is going to happen? Fantastic Personalized question. AI. I believe that the entire web will be generative. So you, you go to any product and the experience will be generated for you. We have to move past this idea of, it's like from rendering to generation. It's almost a disruption of React itself. I, I, I got so high on my own supply of React.js and whatever. Like what React invented is like you write this render function and you have all these parameters. But in a world of LLMs, you have like billions of parameters. And you have not just what the developer knew were the requirements at the time of implementation. It's like, hmm, maybe, maybe there's three states possible for this UI. Well, no, maybe there's a lot more and they evolve over time. So I think the challenge will be on how we can uh, retain a very high bar of product quality and predictability because we have to like somehow like tame the craziness of the AI. That's always going to be the challenge. Function calling uh, as a tool is amazing because it allows us to sort of build that bridge from the unpredictability of AI and sort of like reify it into known schemas of data. So that's one of the ways that you will be able to create UIs that have the generative component but you also determine these are, the, these are the things that I'm interested in for the LLM to generate. Something that's really interesting about the Google example, and I was talking to a lot of the customers of Vercel that are building chat experiences, is that the way to think about it is we're, we've, most people have only implemented one possible UI of the chat experience, which is the list of messages. What I think is really important, and I'm actually bullish on chatbots, is what's really important is that it all starts with the input of the customer. And this was, in my opinion, Google's secret sauce, is that when you arrived to Google.com, all they gave you was the input. And they were so ahead of the curve because they started realizing so that... So what do you mean by input there? So you arrive at Google.com, all they gave you is the input, meaning... The field. Just the, the field. input field. Yeah. And there's, going back to like, you can't click the Zapier logo to update right. their onboarding. Yeah. There's, not, there's almost nothing else to do than to convey 
your input okay. to them. Yep. So what they realized over time is that they started seeing these clusters of queries, right? I, people started searching for like JetBlue 339. Oh, that's a flight lookup intent. So now I can generate a UI. And in the case of Google, it was incredibly effortful. They needed uh, tens of thousands of engineers and lots of PMs. And then they were like, hmm, let's just spin up the PM for flight lookup. So you're gonna, we're going to hand you, we're going to have experimentation infrastructure. We're going to have dynamic rendering, which is what Vercel is trying to commoditize. Like We give you this out of the box. And I'm going to let you focus on that specific s segment of queries alone. With AI, now we can sort of automate a lot of that work. We can say from all of these possible inputs, and all of, excluding all of the refusals, because what happened with Amazon's, I don't know if you saw this, like Amazon launched a shopping assistant, mm. and something went viral that someone started using it as a Rust copilot, asking programming <laughs> language questions on the shopping app on Amazon.com. The so internet you, remains undefeated, as always. So you have to like determine what your queries are and also what your exclusions are. And based on that, you can create, and going back to like the list of messages, you can now start creating very dynamic user experiences based on the user's intent. And I think that's how a lot of these products are going to evolve. OK, great. No, that's, that's awesome. Let's, um, Vincenzo, and then we'll go back. Um, I have a question back to what and you were intro saying. Intro yourself, too. Oh, sorry. Um, background cybersecurity. I'm running a company that does identity security. Uh, the, I had a question about uh, what you were saying earlier around the ossification of open source. Um, so how would you counter that? As in, like, if you had to develop a new product in three years or five years, say, when LLMs are dominant, is it to focus on areas where LLMs are particularly bad, so the, the, the cost of switching from the status quo is not that bad, or is it something else? Like, how, how would you approach it? Yeah, you can take the two approaches, right? You can create a, you can ship your product also with the AI tooling so that now people have a, yeah, internally at Vercel at one point we called this DX 2.0. DX 1.0 was us making like the refresh rate of the editor really fast and the compilation time of your Next.js project really fast. DX 2.0 is to augment that with AI. So you can launch an open source product that also has amazing supplemental AI tooling. That's one approach. The other one is create products that exploit these strengths that the models have and orient your APIs around what the state of the art models are capable of. Um, how much Bitcoin do you own? Or are you buying or selling Bitcoin, just given the Argentina? Um, so I have, a, I have a really funny story with Bitcoin. Uh, I'm the, I'm the co-organizer of the first ever Dogecoin conference in the world <laughs> in San Francisco with the co-founder of Doge. We had all the who's who of crypto. This was like 10 years ago. So I, I was like a Doge, like, like. And that was just meme, like, just fuck it. It's a meme coin. No, so, belief, uh, so, you have some thesis so you know how we're talking about like front end cloud commoditizes services or makes it modular? I believe that crypto will be the true backbone, or at least I consider this to be a case because I'm always pairing about like what are the potential features that I'm like, I have to analyze every possible path. What happens if like, which I would love to, love to see happen, if like all of the commer commerce and transactional infrastructure of the internet becomes a crypto blockchain API. Vercel is still well positioned because you have to create a UI to that experience. And what I believed at the time was like, if I could pay with Doge, I would pay with Doge. So in many ways, Vercel is almost like an opportunity for not just Doge, of course, but like any crypto project to be able to actually kind of give you best of both worlds. You can deliver an amazing customer experience and then plug anything in, 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 in the back, in, through the back. Um, so I've always been super long, Bitcoin, Doge, those two actually, uh, and then um, so I, you're, you're Solana is really 60, interesting. At sixty plus, that you're holding, buying, selling. What are you doing? Uh, buying, buying. Okay. So uh, Argentina, my dad is like really into stable coins. He's always into technology, so that's the caveat. But like the, so I remember I went to Argentina a couple of years ago, and like everybody, like normies, uh, like my high school friends, the popular kids. Like all, like have crypto wallets and knew about stable coins and all that, all that stuff. So it kind of, it kind of like. Well, I feel like Argentina is the yeah, capital it, of like. It's if there's a crypto use case anywhere, yes. it's right there. Right and now, yeah. uh, and people are using it a lot. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so I've invested in a number of companies. I'm very, very excited about um, Lightning. Um, I've been excited for 15 years, so I, I could be excited like I was excited about the Linux desktop. Um, but I'm very, very excited about providing scalability on top of a rock solid foundation. I also believe very strongly in the Lindy effect. The fact that Bitcoin has, be, has remained undefeated and unhacked, and it has the most amazing uptime. Someone is as obsessed with cloud infrastructure as I am, the fact that like, you cannot compete with that level of reliability is kind of fun to think about, right? Like, it's massively distributed. It has its own sort of incentive mechanism to provide availability and to provide nodes. It's self-healing. It's, uh, yeah, cryptographically secure. So it's, it's like an amazing software engineering project. Well, we uh, at Village, we're always looking for extraordinary clarity of thought in the founders we back, and you really have that in spades, Guillermo. It's, it's really been an honor to host you, Thank you. Uh, here. Thank you for the time and the insights, and uh, let's give Guillermo an applause. For that. Thank you. Um, Thanks so much for listening to the Village Global podcast. You can check us out online at villageglobal.vc. We'd love to hear from you, your feedback, your ideas, your inspirations. You can email us at hello at villageglobal.vc.